and you can record it and listen to the recording. Okay, so um, uh, this is going to be part of a, a multi-part series on software entrepreneurship. This is a module of this course that was requested uh, the past few years uh, by multiple classes and um, uh, that reflects uh, a number of features of software that are quite distinctive as an industry. Um, uh, features that make it particularly amenable to entrepreneurship um, and features that uh, encourage entrepreneurship uh, at, a, at, a, at a cultural level as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to be offering a few lectures on this topic uh, as we're working towards the close of the class um, starting here. So, so my... Um, my encounters with entrepreneurship are repeated. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, and, and uh, it's extended over uh, many years. Um, uh, I, I was a partner in uh, three successful startups and uh, involved in several others. These included uh, custom software that is consulting, semi-custom, that is delivery of a product that is repeatedly refined through exposure to several, other, to several clients, and then service delivery. Um, in terms of uh, providing ongoing service. Um, and I remain highly involved in entrepreneurship activities, including owning my own uh, consulting company, as well as being involved in an ongoing uh, small software company uh, spun out of the UFS. Um, uh, and uh, in this time, I've also witnessed uh, and been uh, encountered, uh, have, have, have had encounters with and, and some involvement in several startups that did not do well, that, f that failed. Uh, and uh, that's left me with uh, strong impressions on what works and what often doesn't work. And um, while I'm not a professor of entrepreneurship nor a professor of business um, or management, um, my direct experiences uh, within this area have taught me some lessons. And what's perhaps more notable than what you'll get in Edwards or uh, from uh, faculty of management is that my comments relate very directly and centrally to software entrepreneurship. Um, you'll hear a lot of uh, discussion on campus and a lot of good um, guidance uh, that you can get on entrepreneurship more generally. But software entrepreneurship has its own unique features, risks, challenges, resources, and needs that are not reflected um, by and large as well in the overall discussions of, software uh, of, of entrepreneurship more generally. Um, uh, there are, however, a lot of good books and accounts uh, of people with stronger experience yet that I would I'd refer you to. Now, there's a number of questions. So as I had mentioned, for those who have rolled in since, uh, this lecture came out of several requests over a number of years now, uh, two or three years, from different 371 classes as to giving some guidance as to software entrepreneurship. And principles, tips, um, pointers uh, for this. Um, and to that end, there were several classifications that relate to questions that often come up or, um, or issues that students sometimes raise that I wanted to clarify up front. These questions, uh, for those uh, accessing this more broadly through the internet, these are going to be less immediately germane, but for U of S students, such as the fine group in this room, um, they may be of, of direct relevance, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, indeed, I'd, li I'd love it if you uh, had uh, further interests in software entrepreneurship to, to talk further uh, with me about um, principles beyond what I cover here. One of the features that makes the U of S a particularly good site for software entrepreneurship is that the U of S has a very light touch compared to most institutions, particularly institutions uh, with very large names and, um, and reputations and institutions in other countries such as the states. The U of S has a very light uh, touch, light burden on potential entrepreneurs within the software space. Okay, 
I, I'll distinguish that from entrepreneurship in other areas like biotechnology or, or, or material science where there's patents involved. Undergraduate students within the U of S working on projects are viewed as co-owners of their projects and typically majority co-owners of their projects. Um, uh, so for example, the code base that you folks are building up, uh, you folks own it. Um, those who advised you, Dr. Waba, for example, or myself, have some, some stake in it, but you folks are the overwhelming owners of that. And what that means is you can take in a direction you're interested in, the U of S does not have a claim. It does not have ownership. It cannot, it cannot um, you know, say we want a certain share of that project if you commercialize it. It has no stake in that. Um, this is somewhat rare for, for um, uh, larger uh, research intensive organizations in my experience. Um, uh, and uh, the U of S can therefore be characterized broadly as having a fairly generous policy towards software entrepreneurship. And again, I, I distinguish that from patents. Once it comes to patents, they have a real interest. When it comes to software, they typically uh, do not claim any, any involvement. Um, public GitHub, uh, GitHub projects um, have uh, uh, featured prominently in this course. Um, and they remain subject to copyright uh, laws because uh, the code there cannot be copied or used for derivative work legally by others, um, but it is provided uh, according to the stated, uh, stated license. There's a default license. If you want to impose another license, you can do so within the GitHub ecosystem. Um, and uh, broadly, it's in your interest to proactively head off conflicts. So if you were thinking, and I'm not suggesting you should, but if you were thinking of commercializing a project, maybe with Dr. Waba, maybe for another class, it's in your interest to proactively work to try to head off possible conflict uh, with other stakeholders involved or with others who might have a claim on it. Um, finally, I'll just emphasize an idea. This is something that comes up as a misunderstanding. An idea for a project does not have property protection, meaning you may have a great idea for a software project, um, but by itself, it doesn't have protection associated with it. Um, absent a pre-existing agreement, you can't prevent spread of an idea. So those were some comments motivated by student questions. Why software entrepreneurship? Well, there's a number of draws at a personal level and at a business level. At a, at a business level, there's low capital investment. What do I mean by capital investment? Can anyone say? What do I mean by a, a capital investment? You don't have to buy a lot of stuff? Yeah, you don't have to buy assets. Assets are things that have persistent value. What's a, what's a field of entrepreneurship where you might have to actually buy substantial assets, substantial, say, equipment? Mining. Mining would be a good one. Yeah, that's excellent. What's another one? Retail. Yeah, retail, so brick and mortar stores, potentially, if you're going that older model. You could do retail online with, with less capital investment, for or, sure. Or manufacturing. Manufacturing would be a big one. Um, and biotech is a very, is a thriving scene for that, or entrepreneurship related to, uh, you know, companies in the, in the genetics area. These are, these are areas where often with wet lab needs, there's, um, there's serious capital required. Um, uh, there's a large number of areas where typically you have to purchase equipment to get started. Some of them have just been mentioned. Comparatively speaking, software is cheap. You don't have to get a lot of equipment, a lot of fixed assets to start a company. And the proverbial company started in the garage is an indication for that. People start a company in their house, so they start a company in their basement or whatever. It's a pretty, pretty common thing. There's low overhead. Basically, you gotta pay people and pay for internet service provision and electricity, that sort of stuff. But small, small um, comparatively small cost. There's high growth and profit margins. So a company that has a very successful business model in this area can grow very quickly, often sometimes even too quickly, meaning it can't handle the growth sometimes. Um, and you can get high profit, meaning 
you know, your revenue is much higher than your costs that are pretty attractive, pretty attractive within software because the costs are comparatively small. Even something like hardware, which is related to this, computer hardware, not nearly as favorable because you got to buy solder ovens and you got to buy equipment to, for manufacture or what have you once you get to a certain scale. Profit margins in software can be very, very attractive. Um, there's a diversity of business models. What do I mean by a business model? Can anyone say? Um, how you sell your business. Okay, okay. How you sell it to other people. Okay, so can you give me some examples of, that's a, a very general term and I, I like it. It, it, it um, indeed is responsive to the question. Give me an idea of a, a different business model. What's one way to sort of sell your So you could things. sell it as a one-time purchase. Good. Or you could sell it as a service. That's right. We've seen more and more. That's right. So you could charge software as a service. You're 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 not providing shrink wrap software they buy and install. You know, um, they download it and install it, and they have one license. Instead, you've got you've got uh, a, a service that they can subscribe to, and on an ongoing basis, they could choose perhaps how many seats they need and for how long and cancel it, et cetera. Or you may sell it for a year, right? You sell a, 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 a seat for a year's time, and that allows unlimited use during that year. Uh, you may have business models that are custom. What's an example of a custom business model, custom development? This is very common in software. Premium? So uh, it could be charging a premium, certainly. Oh. Premium, as in oh, oh, you get premium. For free, and you pay for the extra stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's um, uh, that can be. That can also be semi-custom for reasons we'll talk about, um, and it's a pretty pretty common one. There, though, typically, the company will most commonly do that in a way that allows them to retain the ownership over the code base uh, for continued development, or or at least use of the code base for. For ongoing development, even as they add to it, semi-custom is a great pairing with the freemium model. But custom development is all around us. There's a whole lot of companies right here in town, some of which employ interns that are that are custom software developers. It's most commonly goes by the name of software consulting or contracting, and basically they get jobs by companies. They build systems for those companies, they deliver them, sell them to the company. The company that purchased them owns the code base and they move on to a different project. These are, and, and then there's a the semi-custom model where they're modifying it over time. They continue ownership of the code base and they sell successively um, enriched or um, different modules with the system over time, different variants of it. Another thing that's a business draw is rapidly evolving technologies. Why is this a draw? The fact that technology evolves rapidly, why is that attractive for small business startups? Because it allows entrepreneurs to get on to new things quickly. That's right. Compared with large firms where often there's bigger inertia, you got to retrain a whole lot of people. Often these small startups can move nimbly. They can put in place these new technologies more quickly, sometimes disruptive technologies, and they can put together solutions that would be hard for an established competitor which doesn't have the requisite background to employ those technologies quickly to, to compete with. So it allows for sort of small actors, very nimble, agile actors to sort of uh, you know, to, to make good progress within the market. Um, there's mass market use within software. What's an example of a type of software that's not mass market? When I, when I talk about mass market, what's an example of something that's not mass market? Private software? Like yeah, business software? Yeah, yeah. So if I build a custom solution as a consultant for a business, I deliver that to them. That's not a mass market thing. I, I have one client. Maybe I have a very specialized software, which is only for, you know, this particular business. And it's very customized to their line of business, their LOB. 
Um, it's not mass market. What's an example of something that is mass market? Uh, phone apps. Yeah, phone apps are mass market. You go put it on an Apple store, you go put it on the Play store, and it gets downloaded. You charge $1 for it, <coughs> you get a million downloads, you're not doing too badly. Low cost. How much do you pay extra per extra person who downloads it? Basically zero. It can lead to very favorable outcomes. It's not strictly true, for example. It may be that you have to have support calls, right? People want and say, hey, it's broken on my old iPhone, and you got to deal with that. But it's very favorable um, uh, potential with mass market. Um, there's unfilled market issues. There's a lot of things that are just could be done but aren't done. People haven't thought of them or people haven't had the time to pursue them. There's few visible constraints and there's kind of a mythology and romance extending back to the 70s with, you know, Apple and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and 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 early early uh, days of Microsoft or the early days of Google in the 2000s, which has a certain mythology. Um, Personal draws, so those are kind of business draws. Those are things about the software market makes it attractive. Why do, why do people go into a personal level? Well, I've seen many reasons. Some want to be their own boss. You want to turn an idea, a really neat idea, into a, into a practical reality. Um, you, you want to work with close friends. Uh, there's been a number of these projects in this class that have led to people wanting to work together and some spinoffs. There's one from last year. It's a, it's a spinoff that a bunch of people work together and say, hey, we work together great. Let's found a company. So they went and founded a company after the class. After my lectures of entrepreneurship, although I don't know if that helped them. But, but uh, they went and founded a company. So you get to work with close friends sometimes. Uh, you can set the corporate culture. Some people will say, look, I can make a difference. I can leave my mark on the field. Um, you can forge your own path, You know, do unique things. Build a business from nothing and a possibility of doing really, really well financially. Um, what are some of the challenges? What are some of the big downsides? Uh, I could give many war stories in this area. One of the biggest ones, partner tensions. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by partners here? Other people working together? Yeah, it's not only people working together. It's the, it's the co-owners of the firm. We, we often make a distinction in small firms between who are the partners, who are, or that's also the term that's used is who are the players, and who are just the, the employees. Partners are the ones that have equity in the firm. What do I mean by equity? You have a share. You have a share. It's, it can be formalized as a share, and typically it is. But you have ownership over the firm. So you're going to benefit from the firm growing. I'm going to distinguish that from an employee who may not have any share, often as if they do have a share, it's far, far less. And they're basically getting paid. They're getting paid salary to be there. Often the employees, nine to five, the partners, they are working extra hours because they know if they can grow that firm, they may retire at 35 or whatever, right? Um, so when I was at MIT, one of the the number one problem for the entrepreneurship scene, which was very large and which I was part of, was um, partner tensions led to about 40% of failures uh, in terms of small companies. Okay. Um, another one is identifying the business model. What's the right business model for this? What's, the, what's kind of the ecosystem by which this firm is going to make money. Are we, is this going to be a service we're providing? Is this going to be a semi-custom? Is this going to be custom delivery? What, how is this going to work? How are we going to charge for our licenses? How are we going to license this thing? Or is it free? It's free. It's free and we'll, we'll do the freemium model. It's free for use, but we will charge you heavily if you want to extend it, if you want to add features to it. A third one? you find the first successful client. Without the first, if, if the first client is not successful, typically you can kiss your company goodbye, or very frequently, very frequently. Because reputation is often king. If you can get that first happy full client, 
They can give recommendations for others. You get credibility with other possible clients and you build from there. If the first client is unhappy, you can't point to that. People often hear about it and um, you often end up closing up shop. First client is really important. It's a tricky balance because one thing that might make them happy is you charge them less. But by charging them less, you may undercut your sustainability, lose key people because you're unable to pay them what they need. And you go under because you're unable to deliver. I've seen that happen before in a company. Um, another thing is uh, aligning the architecture and business model. This is a, a thing that's dealt really nicely by, um, uh, by a book called Beyond Software Architecture by Holman, which I'd recommend. Um, but basically it gets to, look, how do you build your software to support your business model? And one of the key things there is licensing. How do you license your software and how do you build the technology which will allow for enforcing the license provisions or allow for supporting the licensing model? Another thing is balancing focus and flexibility. You know, to what degree are you just set on one vision? To what degree do you say, well, we'll kind of be opportunistic and do what's needed at the cost of losing, you know, our original idea? No one at the very first small software company I was heavily involved with. It's around 91, 92. Um, first real big consulting gig I did. Uh, it was for a company. They wanted to roll out a new programming language. So it was a great little programming language. And I was giving them advice on compiler side, et cetera. And they ended up deciding, okay, to kind of bring in some money along the way as they rolled out, before they rolled out this language, they do some work in, um, in a different set of technologies to enable existing projects. They never really recovered from that. They just ended up going that direction and they never got back to the real original programming language as a major focus. Um, by contrast, some stick to their original vision very assiduously, you grow, some stick and fail. So you gotta balance like, can we afford to stick to this? Um, how close is this potential idea to what we wanna do? Is it close enough, we'll do it, even though it takes us a little bit outside of what we were anticipating? There's always this need to kind of say, okay, is this too far out of our area of interest? Risk and return. To what degree you need capital to be invested by venture capitalists or angels to continue, or to what degree are you willing to risk it by build, pulling yourself up the bootstraps and retaining your ownership over the company. Growth and stability, can we afford to double each year? There's some companies out there that I go visit that, are, that have grown by a factor of two for the last several years. That's very hard to sustain. Why is that? Why is that hard? Why isn't that just an all good thing? Well, it, it, it's kind of like a bubble effect where it could, could keep growing and growing. And eventually, like all bubbles, it kind of pops. It, it can be. Um, it, it can be. Let, let's suppose that you actually have the clients that you want to you want to bring people on board to deliver for them. What are some of the challenges about if half the people around you are entirely new, how could that affect things? Uh, lower quality software. Yeah, and, and why is that? Because you have so many new people working on it that That's they right. have to get used to everything. Yeah, and... And if you have a lot of... If, if your clientele keeps growing, you're going to have more new people. That's, if you have more new people, right. the quality can get lower. That, that's right. And Who's going to be supporting the new people as they learn? Probably. A group who's going to be training them? A group of trainers and old company people. Yeah, it's probably going to be people who are among the most knowledgeable that you pull off other projects. And so they're going to be contributing less, and the new people are contributing more. And it ends up being a, a situation where you're really dependent on these new folks to, to, to have really high quality. And that's hard to maintain really well. Also, just people don't know how things are done often. It changes the culture. Um, people sometimes feel confused. What are they working on? What are they doing? You have sudden changes that, that confuse people. 
because you know you need to you need to change course because it's not working with uh, with the, the new folks the way you expected based on the old folks etc. Um, so how much do you put in proceeds or you do things in a purely agile way? Um, uh, to what degree do you want income from venture capitalists and and uh, and angels, or to what degree do you want control over the company still yourself? Big thing. Venture capitalists give you money, but they want in return shares of the company and, by extension, control over the company. Often, they often want to get it to go in a way that they feel will be more profitable for their interests over the over the term their interests in being invested. And finally, how to balance hard work and overwork, burnout, risk of burnout. Another issue is incentive alignment. How do you incentivize people to put in, put in the hours to come on board when they're working part-time and they say, well, I'll continue to work part-time rather than coming on board full-time? Um, how do you cross credibility gap with potential clients? You folks are new. I've got this other client who says they do something similar. Maybe their product I don't like quite as much as yours, but how do I know you're going to be around a year from now? How do I know you folks aren't going to go under? How do I know you folks aren't going to just you know, quit and go back to school? You know? um, managing risk, finding senior people. Um, first company I was heavily, heavily involved with, um, we had the good fortune of having as our president for for a good year or two, an IBM, former IBM executive, who is really, really good. Uh, finding senior people who have that gravitas to deal with clients, it's really very valuable, very, very valuable. Um, and, and who have the, the idea that they are predominantly facilitators, um, very valuable. And then you kind of navigate these different domains. One of the reasons that dealing with starting a startup, a software startup is, is, is so uh, challenging but intriguing is the first couple people, you may think you're a coder or you're, you know, you're doing, you're specializing in testing, but you've got to do the finances. You have to deal with the legal side. You have to deal with the human resources, the hiring of folks. You need to deal with sales and you need to deal with marketing. You need to deal with, with, uh, Getting getting the the management um, of of the new people in a in a timely fashion. So someone like Elon Musk or someone like uh, Page at Google or someone like uh, Gates who started technical, you know, they often have to have incredible breadth and in being able to understand things financially, legally, HR wise, managing people, marketing, sales, etc. These are not trivial areas. And if you're not going to do them, who is? You're going to pay through the nose to have someone do legal stuff for you. Whereas if you can handle your own contract stuff, you may save yourself thousands of dollars within your first year from having to deal with a lawyer. So you end up having to, to do this. Now, incubators can be really valuable here. This is one of the reasons incubators do really well, because an incubator will have a legal person who can serve any of their clients, or a financial person who can serve any of their clients, an accountant, marketing and sales expertise in-house that can serve any of their clients. It's one of the reasons incubators, beyond offering a, a physical space, they can offer a lot of help for clients, and often software clients. They know the space. They know how things work, and they can help you. And, and yet, at the same time, you gotta have a stomach for it. <laughs> you gotta have a stomach for, okay, how are we gonna help people know about our products? How are we gonna get the news out there? It's not just coding all the time. It's not just debugging and, and you know, testing. It's, it's a lot more than that. Okay, so those are some of the, the challenges. Let me talk with you about some anti-patterns. I've seen companies fail in a whole bunch of different ways. I've seen companies succeed in a lot of different ways. I want to talk about ways they fail. Anti-patterns, patterns you don't want to emulate. Some of these I've seen many times. 
One is no partnership agreement and no dispute resolution plan in hand. It's you and your buddies and you say, well, we've got a verbal agreement. Risky, really risky. Same thing with dispute management. If you don't have a dispute management plan, it can lead really easily to lawsuits. And I've seen people who are really good friends end up on the opposite side of lawsuits. I've seen it happen multiple times in multiple companies that I've, I've followed with interest or been involved with. So what does a dispute management plan involve? Anyone want to guess? What does it lay out? What does it establish? Probably, I would imagine, some way of handling funds in case there's a dispute with funding. Okay, well, it can extend to funding, but it's actually more basic than that, typically. It involves saying, look, if there's a disagreement between people, maybe it's about funds. Maybe it's about, you know, you said I was going to come on. I said, you claim that I told you I was going to come on full time, and I said I, I did. Um, maybe it's an issue concerning ownership of intellectual property. I say, wait a minute, I, I brought this technology to this company on the agreement that the company would compensate me for releasing my technology to the company after the first client, after the first money was received, I'd be paid back. Or, here's another one, quite common. Partners up front say each will donate $10,000. No, maybe $50,000, or maybe it's five. Point is, they say, I'm gonna donate some money to the company, and once the company starts to get positive profit, those will be paid back. And after a few years, it's not in a position to get paid back, and the person says, well, you know, um, I expect to be paid back for this. It's an indefinite loan at zero interest. Um, and, and the company says, well, you know, what uh, conditions have changed. And you get a dispute. A dispute management plan. So disputes are very common. Dispute management plan basically says the parties who are in dispute, parties who disagree, need to go through a series of defined steps to resolve their dispute where it's an escalating series of steps typically starting with informal meeting going to mediation going to arbitration going to potentially enforcing enforced uh, arbitration extra level and potentially then escalating to legal. Why do you do that? Why lay that out? Because otherwise it has a tendency to go to legal up front and you get a lawsuit. And boy, have I seen that happen. So, so a dispute management plan basically says, hey, look, before you do that, you agree, you're committed in writing to agreeing you're going to try to work it out in person. Mm -hmm. And you have no recourse to legal until you, you've adopted that. The lawsuit will be dismissed because they'd say, well, this, this person hasn't gone through the agreed uh, agreement. Okay, another anti-pattern. You have gross inequity in partner exposure to risk and partner commitment. What do we mean by exposure to risk? You actually used the term in this class, risk exposure. What do I mean? What does it involve? Someone invested a lot more money than another? That can be. But basically, risk is uncertainty that has consequence. And here it involves a combination of probability something happens and, and severity. Often what it is, to speak in very concrete terms with a really small company, is one person is working full time. They've left their job, they haven't, or they haven't, th th their job ended and they haven't gotten another job. They, instead, they're working full time for the startup. They're working full time for this dream, they're starting the, the company. Well, other partners, what are they doing? What do you think? Probably putting in like a couple hours per week. Yeah, and where, oh, 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 what are they doing the rest of the time? 
They're, they're working their job. And this, this is extraordinarily common. You might think it would be obvious, don't do this. People do it all the time. And they'll say, you know, look, by working my actual job, I get advantages for this company. I spot possible clients or I, I learn these technologies or I'm going to come on as soon as, you know, this threshold is reached. And there's all sorts of reasons people give, but fundamentally there's an inequity there. And if they get the same share of the company, could you see why someone might be concerned? If, okay, so I, I have a buddy and we say we each own 50% of it. And then I'm working full time and getting, you know, $100,000 a year salary and they're working full time for the company and, you know, are being paid a thousand dollars a month. Could you see there's a bit of an inequity here? Yeah. Can you see why there's a perverse incentive for me to say, well, maybe I'll join and uh, I thought it would be next month, but I'll hold off for another six months. They might be kind of unhappy, right? It's like, okay, you don't have skin in the game. You know, um, uh, it's all the same to you. Are you really working for the company? So this risk exposure is a key thing. And, and it goes along with commitment. To what degree are they really committing to it, okay? Um, this is one of the foremost issues when you start a company. It's making sure that people's ownership is compatible with their risk exposure and their commitment to it. Um, and this goes along with these part-time partners with fuzzy contingent transition plans. Okay. Um, okay. Another thing is your absence of experience in project management. You, you're not managing the software project well, just sort of hack around and, and no defined testing process and it leads to software which is flaky and which the client doesn't want to use. Okay, another thing, you're entering an unfamiliar, I'd say vertical market. What do I mean by vertical market? Anyone? When I talk about market verticals, what am I talking about? Yeah, it's, it's, so when we're talking about verticals, we're talking about um, companies working in line of business, a particular line of business, say an industry, particular sub area, um, uh, and you're entering this area without knowing a lot about it. An example would be, suppose you, you decided you were going to form a company around cards for, you know, these deck of cards for for doctors, you you need to if if there's not a doctor in your midst, and you don't have someone that you can call on who really knows the medical field well, you're going to have some challenges because you're not going to know the language, you're not going to know, you know how things how things work. How, who do you deal with at a hospital if you want them to adopt this system? Who do you go to? Who's the decision maker with respect to uptake by nurses and physiotherapists and these so-called allied health professionals? You're going to need to come up to speed very quickly on that, and you have to take that, you know, um, uh, take that on in a big way, and you have to seek advisors who do know that area. Another thing is I've seen, and I've seen companies horribly have problems from this is raising too much money. How? How can that be bad? How can it be bad to raise too much money? What what happens as a result? Some features that are not actually needed become That's true. and it takes away from the core functionality. It's true. Of the okay, Th that can be. It can take away from the focus. You end up going in too many directions. You say, oh, now we have money to do this, 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 this sub-project. And it becomes unfocused. What's another thing? You, you will have to, they're going to take, uh, they're going to take a stake. And when they take a stake, they're going to call the shots. I remember some VCs, so I had a, a supervisor uh, for my uh, dissertation who uh, started a company with an old buddy of his, a person he had known for decades, best friend, one of his best friends. The best friend was installed by or aligned with the venture capitalists involved. They raised, I think, $30 million in the first round or the second round of financing, et cetera. They were, they were, they had plenty of money. 
but the VCs were calling the shots. What do we mean by that? Well, he was a technical lead, the guy, the guy who was my supervisor, just a technical lead, but the VCs were saying to do something different. And the founders no longer had that voice they could command what was going on. Often they understood the technology about a thousand times better than these VCs, but the VCs are saying, you know, what's going to get us profit soon? We want to get, we want to get profit on this. You know, do this, do that. And it was a total, it was, it was quite in contrast to the vision they had laid out. But this guy's best friend went along with them and that friendship was you know, destroyed. One of, unfortunately, quite a few friendships I've seen fall apart. So that's one thing that comes from raising too much money. How about another thing? You got to deal with the growth issue. We talked about that earlier. And you, you can, with tons of money, you can hire tons of people. That's not necessarily good. What's another thing? You start to burn money really quickly. And you burn through the money really fast, much faster than you think. You, you end up you end up not using it efficiently. Uh, there's a, there's a, a good book on this in Silicon Valley called Burn Rate that's about this, and it's about the dot-com bubble. You, you folks were young. The dot-com bubble happened. I was well older than you folks are now when the dot-com bubble happened. I remember it very well. And, um, and I knew many people involved in it and who benefited from it for a few years and I saw it I and I predicted it would implode early and it did and um, a lot of it was you know, high burn rate um, tensions the divergent vision run among founders you have a set of founders they have a different idea how they want to see this develop and that comes into tensions and they clash and often one leaves or or a set leaves uh, I mentioned predatory financing the VCs um, less common with angel investors for reasons we'll talk about, but uh, pretty common for, for VCs. Um, uh, business plan is too fuzzy. You're not clear about exactly how you're going to earn money from this and how soon and who your first clients are going to be, et cetera, um, and how big the market is. Um, another thing is you have suits in control. I don't know if you know what a suit is. Do you know what a suit is? I'm not talking about a lawsuit. Yeah. What's a suit? Yeah, corporate people. Yeah, corporate people. So, so people say, hey, I saw you with the suit uh, the other day. You know? um, so a lot, two weeks ago, a suit came to my office. Someone said, Why, why'd that suit come by? Um, so <laughs> it's not uncommon in certain areas of the technology sphere. But suits often don't understand how software development works. And so they try to set the schedule for things, the estimates for things, instead of the software folks. And what do you think happens? Happen. Well, unless the software folks really push back and say, no, we cannot do that during that time. We are not agreeing to that. They kind of go along, and then it doesn't happen. And then the suits get mad, and the suits start to, start to lay people off or put blame on people, and, and, it, and it becomes horrible. It becomes horrible. Um, neglect of soft factors, things like burnout can, can cause big problems for, for a company. Um, sales where the sale is made at way too low a cost, a low to way, uh, too low a price, and it ends up uh, impacting sustainability and uncertainty about, about partners and the ability to trust them. So there's going to be a set of things that we are going to go through in these lectures that are going to include sort of my crude how-to on a set of different issues or, or a guide to issues when it comes to software entrepreneurship. These include financial side, legal side, marketing side, quite different sales side. Marketing and sales are quite different, even though we commonly hash them to the same bucket in computer science. We kind of think they're, you know, things suits do and, and kind of get it get it used out there um, managerial side human resources and uh, the technical side well that's the side you've been learning in a lot of your software engineering courses and other courses 270 370 and some 371 um, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about about incubators um, 
Okay. Um, finances and, and sort of money flow. I want to distinguish here, make a critical distinction between two very different types of startups that are both included in the, if, if someone says, I want to, I want to found a startup coming out of undergrad or coming out of grad school, they'll typically be thinking about one of two types of things broadly, either firms that are small and stay small. They're kind of boutique firms. They stay small. They seek to do what they do very well and deliver comfortably on it. Their goals are not to grow like gangbusters. The other type, large scale growth is sought. They want to grow quickly, you know, double every 18 months or whatever. And, um, and, and become a big player in their area. So there are some, some people want to do a startup and are comfortable with it being a small scale operation and that's their dream. They can have a pretty comfortable lifestyle and still be paid a whole lot of money through, for consulting contracts, for, um, for, for doing work at a smaller scale uh, and, and delivering on it. These are very common. A lot of them are sole proprietorships. What do I mean by sole proprietorship? Yeah, there's only one owner. There's one partner. This is the most common type of business. Set up, you hang a shingle. I'm a consultant in this area. I do you know, Oracle database consulting. I'm an expert in that. And, and uh, Or more likely, because it, it's unlikely you'll do that as much, will be more solution provision. So I'm a full stack developer for for node.js applications particularly with google firebase backends mm -hmm. or i do react native applications or i do app development for apple and android ecosystems mm -hmm. or i'm progressive web app developer or what have you um or it can be a small self consultancy so you have a couple consultants they co-own the shop and you build, you do software contracts, basically. By contrast, there are these larger scale firms, firms which aspire to large scale growth. These would be like a, a semi-custom development where you're, you're owning the software code base and you're developing it and you deliver full value for different clients, but you're continuing to develop it. You could do it faster, more easily, and with richer functions, et cetera, over time. Larger scale consultancies can be in this area, but it's hard to grow them. And software as a service is another thing here. Another thing is, is uh, platforms as a service or where you, you are selling shrink wrap software it can be in this large scale growth. And you, know, you grow faster and faster in this area as you get more satisfied clients. So a key thing, some key distinctions here. Are you selling product or are you selling services? What do I mean by services? So a product would be something mm -hmm. like an app. Yeah. Use it. A service is more like something you use to get work from another person, I guess. So something like, I guess, Grubhub would be a service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like Amazon. Yeah, okay, so you're, you're providing the functionality at any time to undertake some, some, some tasks or some needs. Um, and by providing it as a service, you're doing so not by giving them a, a defined, discrete sort of thing that they install and own and, and can use, but rather you're making it possible for them to do things over time, right? Um, so, so um, I don't know if you folks have ever bought tickets online. Is that a product or a service? Well, it's a service. It's a, it's, a, it's a service. It's a service that sells products. That's, that's a good way to say it. The thing, the, the software itself, there is typically a service. Okay. Um, so, selling products, sell, selling services is an important distinction that comes up in software. Um, 
centrally. Another thing is, what's your target market? Are you targeting individuals? Or are you targeting enterprises? Who are you selling to? Are you selling to organizations? Or are you selling to particular people? They're very different implications. If you're selling to organizations, you've got to have the ability to market to and probably meet and, and mix with those at organizations. If you're selling to individuals, your strategy will often be different. And secondly, are you aimed at a mass market or a niche market, meaning a, a small subset? Or is this something that a very large number of people throughout society might be interested in? Are you a leader? Are you a follower? You're, you're sort of following along the path of another, but maybe dealing with it in a more specialized way or providing a twist. Are you a complementer? Are you providing, what would be an example of a complementer? Give me a, an example. What could you do? Let's, let, let's think related to Google Docs. What could you do for Google Docs to be a complementer strategy? An add-on? Yeah, you do an add-on or plug-in or, or thing you add on. Similarly, you could do it for GitHub, right? Um, you, could, you could sell GitHub plugins, so you could have a plugin for Eclipse or what have you. It complements some existing product or service, but you allow them to take it further. There's some strengths of that. There's some vulnerabilities of that. And, um, you know, uh, are you aiming for scaling up? Or are you aiming for sort of uh, duplicating your product over time um, or, or making it more fine-grained sort of differentiating. It. Um, okay, so a couple strategies and then we'll break so I can get to this other commitment. One is custom contract delivery. Um, here it's not scalable. You're, you're delivering on contracts for this client, for that client, for that client. You have a certain number of people who can deliver. You're delivering a code base to solve their problem. They have the code base after that. And next client, you're going to start pretty much from scratch delivering from them. You only have so many people. You can only deliver for so many of these clients. It's custom, meaning each one is different. And therefore, there's not a lot of common things you get. But each one, you might get paid quite a lot. They'll pay you you know, $250,000 to deliver this within nine months. Great. You go and you deliver it, and then you do your next one. You do your next one. And you've got good cash flow coming in, but you're, you know, you're busy at any one time. You hope you're busy, you know, so, so that you can deliver. Another one is semi-custom contract delivery. Here, you own the IP. You own the intellectual property. You own the code base. Maybe you're extending it some over time, but you're selling them product based on that code base. Maybe you ha they have a non-exclusive license to use that code base in perpetuity for their own purposes, but you retain it. Why does it matter that you retain it? Because you can build on it. Then you can build on it for another client, right? And maybe it's the sort of thing where not, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna lose any comp competitive advantage. You sell it to another client, they're not, in the business of competing, perhaps, in involving the software. So you sell it to another client. You've, you, you've got this asset, and you can sell that asset now uh, to another client for you know, a product that offers similar value, and it becomes easier and easier. And you extend it with more and more stuff. So it's richer and richer. And sometimes you come back to that earlier client, you give them the extra modules, and you sell it to them. And you've got this IP being built up over time. And the people who are getting the software often pay for it similar to custom. Because as far as they get it, they get a code base. They get you know, the product they want. Why shouldn't they be paying similar to what they do in custom? The difference is you own the continuing IP so you can sell it to other clients who are no concern to them. The software as a service where you have service delivery over time. Um, you're, you, there's no rollout. You're not. You're, you're just. You've got it in your website, for example, and you can version it over time as you see fit. You don't have to go deliver the new version to the customer and roll it out at a larger scale level against their, across their organization, etc. Um, and uh, you might have a cost per transaction that you caught. You 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 charge them. 
Uh, and then you may have a subscription model per seat per year. This is a bit like the Costco model, right? You, you're paying a certain amount per year for a subscription. And that allows you to use it as much as you want during that year. And in fact, you're, you're incented to use it a lot so you can get the most out of that money it cost you. But meanwhile, you get a steady stream of revenue from them as they're using it. Okay. Okay. I got to go now. We will continue on this discussion next time.